and we will be moving on to our next speaker. Uh, so this morning we've had a, a little bit of a last minute change. Um, so uh, just to confirm, you are in the the platform stream uh, now. Christian Posture Poster was was meant to be joining us this morning, but unfortunately, uh, right at the last minute, he's not been able to join. Uh, and so Nick Nellis has jumped in uh, and very kindly agreed to speak um, and and cover off the same topic. Um, so he's running a little bit on the fly. So. Uh, uh, Let's all give him a warm welcome. Um, Nick is a, a Kubernetes and cloud administrator slash evangelist, and he loves using new technologies like Istio and Envoy to ship awesome products. Uh, he's a field engineer with Solo, and Solo uh, delivers API and service mesh solutions across any infrastructure, specializing in the use of Glue Edge and Glue Mesh. Uh, so thank you very much, Christian. I will hand over to, sorry, Nick, what am I saying? Yep. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, and um, and we're looking forward to hearing from you. Yes, thank you very much. I actually thought about giving the presentation as Christian, but um, <laughs> he looks a little better than I do. So. Um, yeah, but I'm here today. Um, we're going to be talking about some service mesh, um, and specifically um, the top five challenges of running a service mesh within your enterprise, in your organization, and talk about how, you know, these problems of adopt things about you, you should think about as you adopt a service mesh um because it gets a lot harder once you start dropping it into production and managing it and so we're going to walk through some of those things today um but before we begin my name is Nick Nellis. Um, i've been working with istio for a long time now um back in the early days i was at ibm working for the weather channel and we were working on adopting istio and running that it got it to a qa type environment. And now I'm at Solo and we are all about service mesh. Um, we are the leading uh, company in the service mesh space. We have a number of products that help you adopt and implement service mesh within your own organization. We even offer Istio support for those who have already started their journey in a service mesh and need some help and got into a bind. Um, we originally started with our Glue Edge product, which was an API gateway that was built for Kubernetes. It was built on top of Envoy um, back in the early days when Envoy was released. And it's become really powerful in the features that it offers. It. OAuth, rate limiting, um, was, we, we just released WASM filters um, recently. And we are working on GraphQL uh, functionality as well. And so it's a really empowered API gateway that um, can help your organization do a lot of cool things um, as you migrate to Kubernetes or you know, more microservice-based architectures. And then we're moving, talk about Glue Mesh, which is built on top of Istio, and that enables Istio to work in multi-cluster, multi-environment type situations. And um, we'll talk about some of the complexities there, of why Service Mesh and where it is today, and why you know, Glue Mesh is actually why we're in that space and solving that problem with Glue Mesh. Um, we also have two other products, Glue Portal, and which is our API interface. So you can upload your your API schemas and then host APIs directly through it. Um, and then extensions. Um, you can part of our Wasm integration. You can go and write your own filters and then apply them within our API gateways. Um, a little bit more about Solo. Um, we this. Giga OM report recently came out that showed that we are outperforming and we are more mature than our competitors and we're really rapidly um, innovating in the service mesh space. And so, you know, if that service mesh is something that's on your radar, we're definitely the people you should come and talk to. Um, but before we kind of um, dive into those, those top five problems, we should probably establish, you know, the baseline of what we're talking about with service mesh. And so we're gonna start with service to service communication. Um, and that's just simple service A talking to service B. Um, everyone does it, uh, even if monoliths talk to other monoliths or microservices talking to other microservices in any type of environment. And there's a lot of challenges in doing so. Uh, you need to find out where those other services are. You need to figure out how you're gonna connect and communicate with them. Um, and then you want to build in some resiliency and make sure that, you know, that communication is is robust and resilient. 
Uh, and then one of the biggest things that service mesh um, brings is observability. And so you want to know what's happening from service A communication to service B. Uh, this year, one of the biggest um, pushes is going to zero trust networking. And so how do you secure those edges, of that communication from one service to another in an organization where you may have you know, thousands of services talking to each other? And then how do you slot in um, filters and how do you do some custom logic on the communication between them that the app developer may not necessarily need to, to know about or care about? Um, it back, back when I started writing services um, to communicate with each other, we had, a, we had a host of tools that we, we used to stitch them all together. We were using the Netflix libraries, Hystrix, Zool, we were doing circuit breaking and routing. And, those were you know, Java libraries that you baked directly into your application. You use council for service discovery and then maybe traffic for routing as well. And so you know, really kind of um, convoluted architectures and a lot of different moving pieces to get, a to get some of that functionality. And now today we can, we can move on to service mesh, which solves a lot of these problems directly. Um, this is a, kind of your typical architecture with most of you should probably be familiar with. And that's where you have this you know, centralized API management where if a service wants to communicate with another service, largely it's talking to a load balancer somewhere else. And so you're, you're making a lot of extra hops and, and it's, it's simplistic in that it's easier for you to manage, but it's, it's not effective um, and it can always be improved. And so that's something where Service Mesh is really gonna you know, show its power and being able to be more intelligent about your routing. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, this We wanna talk about how this doesn't actually fit your cloud native architecture. You know, a lot of you, if you're running in Kubernetes already, um, this is something that you don't want to do is leave your Kubernetes cluster to just come back and talk to an application in the same Kubernetes cluster. And so there's a lot of technologies out there that will fix this um, and service mesh being one of those. And so what we can do is enable uh, something to run alongside your workload and that doesn't, and Kubernetes, we call that a sidecar, but we, this also can just be um, a proxy running on the same VM next to your workload. And that allow them to communicate directly. And so with that proxy there, we can do a lot of really interesting things. We can, we can configure them as a holistic uh, bunch and then apply different kinds of routing, resiliency, observability, all without having to touch your workload. And so it leaves the developers to work on their business logic, and then the operators to come in and define that networking architecture that you want. Um, and so, do you need a service mesh? Well, we should probably start there. Um, and it really depends on where you are in your journey and what, what your needs are in your organization. Um, do you have a few monoliths? Are you looking to go to a microservice architecture? Um, or is you know, security top of mind between communications between those applications? Are you looking to break up the roles? You know, the developer works on the business logic, the operator manages the network and the communication. And if so, then, you know, service mesh is definitely something you should really take a look at because it really, you know, separates those responsibilities and then you can program them from a, kind of a higher level where you can control the, the network as a whole. Um, so let's dive into the five challenges of running a service mesh. Um, they're not necessarily in order of um, intensity or the largest challenge first, just five of the biggest ones that we deal with when we are working with a lot of our customers. Um, but number one is which service mesh should you pick? There's a lot of um, technologies out there today. They, a lot of them claim to do service mesh. A lot of them have different features and so you know, a lot of them are even built on different proxying engines. So um, we've at Solo have adopted Envoy as our proxying technology because of its maturity and its robustness and its configuration. It allows you to do so much powerful things for modern web development. It was really built for, you know, the modern age and cloud architectures. And so building on top of that is something you definitely want to look for in a service mesh. Um, but there's still a lot of service meshes, as you can see here, built on top of Envoy. So how do you, you know, even narrow that down further? Um, and it comes down to you know, 
features, maturity, production deployments, and the leader there is clearly Istio. And most of you have probably already uh, have heard of Istio and some of the others, but Istio really is leading the pack in um, service mesh technologies, and it offers the most features on top of Envoy today. And so if you were looking at a service mesh, I would recommend you start with Istio. And then also from a support standpoint, if you look at who's supporting all these different technologies, you have a lot more vendors and companies supporting Istio today. And so you know, the community is extremely large as well within Istio. And so if you go on and start your service mesh journey and you want that real uh, intimate uh, communication between you know, like developers of Istio or in you know, like some enterprise support, you're going to find more of that with Istio than the other technologies. So how does a mesh fit in with your existing API gateway technology? So largely, our customers don't have a strategy for adopting service mesh and an API gateway technology together. Largely, the, most organizations see those as two separate things. But we're so at Solo, we're leading the pack and trying to stitch that together to show you how we can move to a cohesive uh, mesh architecture that includes the gateway. And so um, this is one of the challenges today is really how do you stitch those together? How does a gateway know about you know the, all the underlying mesh behind it? And that's something that um, not all mesh technologies today have solved. But Something that's so that we we care deeply about and been working on for a long time. Um, if you look at some of the, even within Istio, we can talk about some of the features within Istio that are still missing from an API gateway perspective. Um, and if, on the right hand side here, you see the table. So Istio's gateway today does not it supports most of these features, but they are not easy to implement uh, without some extra help today. And so, you know, the OAuth. You, it takes a lot of a little bit of different infrastructure to implement, and you got to deploy a couple different tools to make that work. Um, web, web application firewall is something that Istio does not support today, and so there's a, a host of other ones as well. And so even Istio being the leader in the service mesh space is still a long ways to go, and it's something that where the vendors like Solio have an opportunity to really expand service mesh into these areas of an API gateway. Um, and we just recently announced the Glue Mesh Gateway, which actually does a lot of this stuff. And so it's really stitches, it builds on top of Istio and it stitches these um, features into the Ingress Gateway of Istio so that you really do have more of a full featured service mesh. And it extends beyond just service to service communication. It really brings that Ingress Gateway into your um, mesh and supports all these really great features that modern API gateways support today. Um, global service and routing is, is probably one of the biggest challenges that we see from an organization trying to stitch together all of their different infrastructure and clusters and VMs and data centers. And how do they make you know, those more, and even part of cloud migrations, how do they you know, still support communication with their legacy applications and their monoliths? And service mesh today still is, has a long way to go in this area, especially when it comes to multi-cluster scenarios. And so there's a lot of, lot of room for growth in the service mesh technology for multi-cluster multi -cluster routing failover. And it's being able to take these different environments and treat them as a single mesh. And that's something that our glue mesh product really does really well because it just doesn't, um, it's, a, it's a really large challenge um, that most organizations just don't have the resources to dedicate to, to solve themselves. Um, and the, one of my examples here that I put in here is, is what we call like unintelligent routing. If you can see in my diagram here, we have application that A that wants to call application B, but application B actually is a multi-cluster application. It's deployed in two different environments. And so if you really want that high availability and routing be between application, the two application Bs, you actually have to call the ELB from application A. 
And that's actually not very intelligent. You're like, hey, can't I just call that application B in, in my own cluster? And that's where something that service mesh is still not really up to the task um, today for the most part without some support from our tooling or some of the other vendors. And so what you what we can do with service mesh then is actually be more intelligent about how that routing occurs. You know, have application A call application B directly because it knows it's the closest one to call. But in the case that that application, is, application B is not available or not healthy, we should, should still be able to fail over and call the other application B. And so we're offering the same kind of feature uh, high availability, high available features, but we're doing it more intelligently and it'll actually improve your resiliency and your routing. Um, so this has been a really big push for our, for the customers that we've been seeing lately. Um, and it's how do we support our certificate management and our PKI infrastructure within a service mesh? Um, there's a, a lot of complexity, um, if especially as Service Mesh has kind of bled into becoming between an ops and a developer role. Um, how you know, you're getting you're exposing developers more to the infrastructure side than you've ever done before, and that includes you know security things like certificate management. And it's really important that that certificate management is secure and well managed. And that's something that Service Mesh still struggles with today. Um, you, if you want clusters to talk to each other securely, you need to be able to set up your PKI infrastructure to be able to create your cert CA certificates so that um, they can trust each other when the communication leaves one cluster for another one. And so with the big push specifically in the US this year is the going to zero trust architecture. and we have a lot of companies calling us and saying, you know, we just need help with zero trust infrastructure. It's something we've never done before. And if you aren't really in a, using service mesh today, it's nearly impossible to get your to get uh, workload certificates to your applications so that they can authenticate with other applications that they're communicating with. And so that's something with service mesh has made easier, but it still is a long way to go. Uh, and then extending the service mesh. So today, Service Mesh has a pretty well-defined role within uh, your infrastructure. But getting beyond that actually is going to offer a lot more power. But the walls uh, beyond where the Service Mesh ends becomes, or the, if, the number of variables that you have to deal with becomes infinite. And so extending a Service Mesh to work within your organization largely becomes a lot of work on your end. Um, tuning, you know, the, the, infra the PKI infrastructure, DNS, um, service deployments, configuration, all this stuff really has to start to come in once you adopt the service mesh. And you're going to have to implement a lot of the supporting infrastructure around a service mesh. And so, you know, at Solo, we've built a lot of tools to help expand the service mesh just beyond like a local cluster or a set of clusters. It's really getting into all the different pieces that help make your developers experience for shipping software and features faster and more effective. And so there's a lot of work to be done yet in this space, um, but it's hard from an open source perspective because of the amount of different variables you have to deal with and different uh, use cases and workloads that you kind of have to uh, plan for, and it's almost um, too daunting for a project to even uh, undertake. Um, another big one is, you know, a lot of us are running VMs, so we still are we're in a migration pattern, or we have lots of data centers that just run lots of VM workloads. And, you know, how do you, stitching those into a service mesh is still not easy today. There's a lot of variables, as I said in the last slide, that really come into how do you connect these things? How do you install software alongside your existing VMs so that they can join a mesh, that they can utilize the features of service mesh and be more resilient, fail over um, high availability. And so, again, this, this is a, a pretty big problem today. You know, you don't just want your modern workloads to 
have the benefits of service mesh, you actually really want to like extend that beyond just like say Kubernetes and really get it, you know, put it next to your monoliths or, you know, make your models a part of the service mesh and, you know, get a lot of the great features out of it. Uh, it we've been working with a lot of companies to do this um, exact thing is we help them, you know, get that, that monolith into the service mesh so that they can break it apart more easily. You can use the routing intelligence and the failover so that you can break off pieces of an API and still have that consistent feel from the outside. And so there's a lot of work to be done in this space yet today. Um, and it looks like I still have some time yet. So I wanted to go back to um, the global service routing and kind of talk about why it is one of the big challenges of service mesh today and, and kind of show you some of the complexities that really are inherent when you go to um, this multi-cluster, multi-mesh kind of architecture. And so it is meant to overwhelm you a little bit, but it's showing you that, you know, what the complexities are of, of some of the things that you need to support in a, you know, a large organization when you adopt service mesh. Um, and so this is the slide I'm going to start with here. So we have an external client and they're calling webapi.mesh.cposta.solo.io. And it's going to, we have two of those deployed in two different clusters. And so we want that to be highly available. And so we have an ELB at the top, which is routing to our two API gateways. And those API gateways send traffic to the web API application. And it's a little small here on the stream, um, but you can see that it's running in both clusters. Now, with service mesh being in each of them, we want to be able to, do, if a web API in one of the clusters is not healthy, we want to stitch those API gateways together so that we can, if uh, API gateway on the left side here were not would not have a web API healthy, we want to be able to send that traffic then over to the other API gateway. And this might be kind of like a regional type failover or something. And this will still allow traffic then to flow to a healthy web API. And then we also want that to work within the applications themselves. So if web API, you can see is calling a recommendation service. And so if that recommendation service is not healthy in your local cluster, we again want that to fail over to another cluster to go call another recommendation service. And to do that, we need to stitch together more gateways. Um, in Istio, we call those east-west gateways. And so that communication, we actually want to be um, secure and authenticated. So we use MTLS to do so. And to stitch MTLS into a multi-cluster scenario, you have to do a lot of really good certificate management um, and pass through to make sure that when a web API is calling any recommendation service, we always know it's web API calling recommendation because we can turn on our authorization rules to make sure that um, you're authenticated and it's the correct application that's calling. Um, and so these are, you know, shows some of the complexities here of a multi-cluster scenario. And that's something that service mesh is still evolving into. Um, as people, as Kubernetes and clusters become easier to run and easier to stand up, these problems are, are starting to pop up more and more in our customers' environments. And so we're, we're guiding them through some of the challenges of you know, secure multi-cluster, multi-failover type environments. Um, and then at the bottom here, we see we have a management plane or federation controller. And so what you need to do then from a service discovery perspective is tell each cluster about the applications in all the other clusters. And so that doesn't really exist today in your open source um, service mesh uh, and technologies. And so that is a, an addition that's something like our glue mesh has, where it's a lot, it tells your applications in each cluster where you can reach um, the, the application you're trying to reach in any other cluster, and then how to do that securely. Um, and then on top of that, um, in the first one, I showed that we had two different API gateways. But if we, we can actually move those API gateways out into a single global API gateway routing framework, and then so you now have, you know, failover and intelligence from a, a higher level. And we see this a lot of times with our really large organizations where they have a global API into their infrastructure or, you know, regional dedicated API gateways. And so this may actually be managed by from a different team, uh, largely like 
the global ingress team, for example, and they want to do you know web application firewall geo blocking or geo based IP filtering and failover and so, and observability, and so this you know adds to the complexity of service mesh, but it's something that we're expanding into really deeply and investing in is stitching all of this together in a seamless experience because of the complexities of you know service mesh and how it works today. Um, and so at Solo, if you're really excited about uh, service mesh as I am, um, give us a call. We're, we're hiring all over the world. We have engineers um, supporting at a global presence and we're looking for more. Um, so if that's something you're really passionate about, feel free to reach out to us. Um, and then we'll be also giving some talks at Service Mesh Con as well. So if you know if your company is looking for a Service Mesh, you know check out our events. We we give talks like these all the time um, about Service Mesh, and and that's it. So thank you very much. All right. Thanks so much, Nick. You've done a tremendous job picking up uh, with with just a moment's notice. So uh, I, I really appreciate you. you coming in and uh, joining us because um, it, it's been an absolute delight. Um, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, thank you. And uh, team, do do forward through any questions if if you have them. Um, but yeah. Very insightful presentation. I always, I always love those diagrams and, and deep diving into those at the end. They are meant to overwhelm right. you a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, they do. Yeah, you've sufficiently done that for, for me at least, Nick. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Um, so I, I think that's everything then, Nick. So thanks so much for your time this morning. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll keep in touch uh, and, and folks don't uh, hesitate to reach out to Nick at Solo.